The day was December 2, 2001. Millions people lost their estimated $60 billion and about 20,000 people lost their job overnight. This scandal make US government make regulatory reforms. The Enron scam is still marked as one of the biggest scams and scandals in the history. From a merger vision of the Houston Gas Company and InterNorth Incorporated, CEO and chairperson Kenneth Lay brought the company far enough to become a household name within less than a decade. But how did a company once valued at $90.75 per share plummet to just 26 cent? Guilty verdicts in the biggest case of corporate fraud in history. 38 counts of fraud and conspiracy. Lawyers for Jeffrey Skilling and Kenneth Lay threw around complicated notions about margin calls and short selling. America changed forever. Enron filed for bankruptcy December 2nd, 2001. Houston Gas Company used to sell the gas produced by the Houston Pipe Company, and InterNorth used to explore and produce coal and petroleum. Kenneth Lay was the primary visionary for the merger company Enron. The merger between the Houston Gas Company and InterNorth Incorporated led to the beginning of one of the most successful energy corporations in the world, HNG InterNorth, in 1986. Eventually, it was named Enron. The company was booming until the 1990s when the U.S. Congress decided to put a stop on the sales of natural gas throughout the country. This halted the pipelines of Enron. But there was no pause for the business. Lay's mastermind led the company to become a medium between natural gas supply and the customers. The producers of the gas were willing to form a dealership with Enron because they did not have any risks to take. The best risk mitigating technique by the company was to fix a certain price through a contract that would ensure the suppliers of what they were getting themselves into. Jeffrey Skilling was the person behind the idea, and he excelled at it. With time, Skilling also became the chief executive officer of Enron. With the launch of Enron Online in 1992, the company was able to increase trades through a website. Skilling's authority led the company to great heights. With the increase in the profits of the company in a short period, Jeffrey made sure to hire the best MBA graduates from all around the world to upgrade his company profile. There was no stopping for the company as there were only highs, and that too in a very short period. Trading with Enron had been a dream to many at that time, and the bull market of the 90s gave the company a sense of optimism at extremes. The acquisition of Portland General Electric in 1997 expanded its presence in the electricity market, while the purchase of Wessex Water in 1998 marked its entry into the water utilities sector. Additionally, the formation of Azurix in 1999 aimed to establish Enron's foothold in the water utility market. In an attempt to achieve further growth, Enron pursued a diversification strategy. The company owned and operated a variety of assets including gas pipelines, electricity plants, paper plants, water plants, and broadband services across the globe. Enron earned profits by providing services such as wholesale trading and risk management in addition to building and maintaining electric power plants, natural gas pipelines, storage, and processing facilities. During the 90s, it had been almost impossible to even picture the downfall of Enron. The boom lasted for no less than a decade, but then came the rise of competitors. It only took an amount of awareness and knowledge for many other trading houses to take over. With an image to keep intact and successful in the outer world, the company began some malpractices. It was mostly about how everyone else outside Enron viewed it that primarily led to its downfall. The company soon shifted its troubled operations to its special purpose entities, SPEs. Basically, these SPEs became a trash site for the company. This was also an easier way out of what would have tarnished their image in the shorter run. Fasto was responsible for the running of some of these SPEs. Arthur Anderson, on the other hand, was the consultant of the company. 
Skilling left the position of the chief executive officer while Lay took back the position. Lay received an anonymous message from Sharon Watkins, the then vice president of Enron, who had been threatened by the moves that had been made through partnerships with Fasto. The message suggested the possible threats and risks that Enron had when it came to accounting and finances. There was a lot of lying and manipulation in the financial statements of Enron that had been publicly released. After the release of the financial documents of Enron by the Securities and Exchange Commission SEC, under the authority of Anderson, his employees started shredding the documents that showed the transaction between Fasto's SPEs and Enron. In July 2000, Enron Broadband Services and Blockbuster formed a partnership to enter the burgeoning video-on-demand market. The VOD market was a sensible pick, but Enron started logging expected earnings based on the expected growth of the VOD market, which vastly inflated the numbers. By mid-2000, EOL was executing nearly $350 billion in trades. From a whooping $90 to merely $12, the share value of Enron dropped immensely in 2001 after the official audits were out. In order to avoid any further losses and risks, the company decided to acquire Dynegy. However, Dynegy took a step back as they too were at a big risk. By the end of 2001, Enron even took Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection. After everything, the company's shares finally dropped to less than $1. The efforts to save the image were constant. There was a new set of board of directors in Enron by 2004. These stakeholders sued around 11 institutions in total in an attempt to save the reputation of Enron. This, to an extent and though temporarily, helped the employees conceal the bad state of the company. Likewise, the executives of Enron were able to land a settlement of $7.2 billion in the process. Lay was hence protected from the 11 charges against him. But, there was more to the fraud and Kenneth was charged with 45 years in prison alongside six counts of securities and wire fraud. Before he could be punished, he passed away in 2006. On the other hand, Jeffrey Skilling could not save himself from the accusations of insider trading and frauds. This cost him 19 counts of securities, fraud out of 28. He was also 24 years and 4 months in prison. With a settlement of his punishment with the US Department of Justice in 2013, his prison time went down by a decade. Andy Fasto and Leah, his wife, were both charged guilty for fraudulence, money laundering, insider trading, conspiracy, etc. They were sentenced with 10 years in prison with no parole to testify against the Enron executives. Fasto has long been out of the prison as of the current time. There are more than just one cause that led to the Enron scam. One of the major reasons being a very complex organizational structure. In order to keep the company alive, the Enron executives had been forced to confuse the investors and hide what were actually the facts. Special purpose entities let Enron borrow money without having to label the loan as debts. The company started transferring stocks to these special purpose entities while receiving note receivable in their financial statement. This helped the company conceal a fair share of their actual financial state. Nothing quite went as per the contracts and Enron, along with auditing firms, made incorrect financial records. Many of the deals had expired while the statements showed recurring revenue. The employees and the shareholders were paid through a very badly constructed compensation agreement. Moreover, there were many parties, including consultants, auditing firms, and other financial service providers, who got to learn about Enron's fraudulent practices early on in their malpractice journey. However, their financial relationship as well as compensatory factors kept their mouth shut for a long while. Similarly, Enron had been extremely optimistic because of the company's booming years. This led to them having unrealistic expectations, which led them to keep their downfall non-transparent for the longest time possible. Additionally, finances, sales, and operations of the company were also heavily ignored while Watkins, 
the former vice president of Cooperate Governance, had openly talked about the financial statements of Enron as they kept occurring now and then. And I stumbled across very large accounting fraud at Enron in, in a very typical fashion. I switched positions. So, you know, a fraud sort of comes on slowly. I mean, how many of you have Enron went bankrupt in 2004. That was too severe. In 2006, the last company under Enron, Prisma Energy, was also sold away. The Enron scam has been labeled the biggest fraud in the history of the financial world. In the process, the shareholders lost several billion dollars while the employees had to lose billions in pension. Enron's biggest executives, namely Kenneth Lay, Jeffrey Skilling, and Andrew Fasto, are known to be the masterminds who once made the company one of the biggest financially operating cooperate houses in the world. Also the same people who drowned the company in less than a decade's span. There was no rising for Enron once their scam and scandalous actions were out. Therefore, it would be fair enough to conclude that Enron will possibly never rise again.